So that picture of me that was up there before this started was back in 2015 when I was lucky enough to present at the first Dart Summit. As you can see, there's not the gray hair up in that picture. That is not a direct re reflection from working on Angular Dart. It's exactly the opposite, actually. So, so I'm Eric Warner. I work at TrustWave on the portal infrastructure. And today, we're going to talk about the power of Angular Dart and how we built out our customer portal taking advantage of it. So let's go over a little bit at the beginning of what we're going to cover. So at first, we'll talk about building out a large-scale portal and what that means for TrustWave portal development. It's kind of set the landscape and the view that we're looking at. And then we'll look into what we were looking for when we went into a new UI initiative to get off of our leg uh, legacy technology we were using. Then we'll look at what did we consider at that time when we were going down this endeavor? What was out there? What was in the landscape before we made the wise choice of picking Dart and Angular Dart? And then we'll jump into what we've taken advantage within Dart as far as building out a base component for our teams to use to develop with, taking advantage of routing and deferred loading to lazy load our portal as it goes through, as the customer goes through our portal, take advantage of UI components and building those out for our teams to use, and then also the tools that we have taken advantage of and why we chose Dart to begin with. So Trustway Portal Development, we have a large scale portal that we build that has about 15 distributed teams that is about 50 plus developers that are divided across these teams. And they build about 35 different applications that take advantage of 1,000 plus Java services that we built on the back end using Spring. Some of those are part of our portal infrastructure that we build out, but a lot of them are from our product service teams for the, the services that need to support the views that are built out for those products. We have 40,000 unique global users that log into our portal, one portal, on a daily basis. So all this is brought together from our team development that takes place, and we got to make sure that we bring it into one build and leverage whatever technology we're using to build out some sort of framework that the teams can take advantage of. So we'll go back a little bit. It was 2013. We had a legacy portal that was built off of using Flex with Flash, and we all know what's happened with Flash. It's died, it's dead. The browsers have caught up with what we could take advantage of at that time. It was a good choice back then, but the browsers have caught up. So we were looking for what's next, what are we gonna go to? So what were we looking at at that time? There was you know, the team development we had to take advantage of, but we also had to look at new requirements coming in. So we wanted to make sure that we could build out a portal framework, and that for our customer experience when they came to our portal, it had a quick initial startup time. We didn't want them sitting there and waiting for the download to take place. We wanted it to pop up quickly for them. That means also we wanted to lazy load our portal. The teams, as they work on these views that they're putting together for their products, we don't want it to download all at once and have this big memory footprint within the browser. We want to incrementally grow the portal as the user goes through it. We want it to be fast rendering within our UI components so there's not a lot of waiting for the user as they click through. And we want to take advantage of something that we call in the past deep linking where we can send URLs to our customers that they can click on and go right to the area within the portal so they don't have to log in and dive in from there. And also that they could bookmark these URLs to get back quickly to the area they wanted to go to within our portal. Then there's the team development that we've discussed previously. We have a unique look and feel at TrustWave that we go off of for our portal. So we want to make sure we have a set of shared UI components that the teams can use that are built in a consistent manner with the proper styles so they don't have to worry about that when they build out their products. This goes along with also a base component that they can leverage and use as well, that they can rely on that's going to build in and, and bring in services for, their, for base things like security and locale information that they don't have to worry about on their side so they can concentrate on their product. We want to have quick dev cycles. We want to have our developers be able to make changes, see it in the browser right away, and not have to wait for some compile step to take place before they can see what their change was so we can deliver quicker. A short learning curve was something that was on our list as well. We have a lot of our developers are both you know, back-end developers, and then we have purely UI developers, but most of them work full stack development. So we wanted to make sure whatever technology we picked was intuitive to them and there was a short learning curve so they could come up to speed quickly and start building this out. And then of course, testing involved in it. The components we build on our team and the portal infrastructure, we wanna make sure we can test them so we supply all good components for our teams to use. 
And then you look into the tools that need to come with this as well. If we have this team development, we need to make sure that we can have core sets of libraries and we can bring this all into one build that goes out. So we need the dependency management on top of it, a good IDE integration, and then be able to do continuous integration builds out to our test areas with our DevOps team and the prod ops teams to production. So back in 2013, when we looked into this, you can see there's just a plethora of choices out there that we could pick from. So you, most of these are JavaScript frameworks, and that right off the bat kind of made me sick to my stomach a little bit when you look at the team development we were doing and trying to bring this together. And then also, you know, there was GWT at the time, and we could have gone backwards and went that way, but we wanted to pick a technology that was going to stay in the front and keep up with the times and always increase and get better and better, and something that we can stay out of the spaghetti code land of JavaScript, where building that, bringing that into one building going forward just made me kind of just quiver a little bit. So say hello to Dart and Angular Dart. So it's back in 2013 again, I keep going back in the time machine, and we're sitting there and we say, hey, look, the Dart SDK's out here, let's check it out. So what we started doing is some prototyping, and then we started doing some brown bags internal with our engineering teams, and we were building just some command line, talking to web sockets and bringing it in. This was even before the, the package HTML was out there for building any type of UI. So what did we discover at that point? Well, we discovered that this is, a, this is a complete SDK with a core set of libraries and tools that we could leverage for building out our portal going forward. It was very, it's, it supports high quality tools, large scale, like I said, and then extensive libraries that were out there that we could pick up from other people that are contributing third party libraries. So this was something that coming from a background that we have some Java developers or no matter what software language you were coming from, it was, we were getting feedback through the brown bags. It's like, this is very intuitive for me. It's, I can pick this up very quickly, and it has everything that I've leveraged in the past in other languages, and I can take advantage of it, and I don't have to play around in the JavaScript land on these things. It has a great cross-compile over to JavaScript. It's like, oh, that's great, because we've got to make sure that we can support all the major browsers that are out there. And then the, the one that really sold us at the end is when the switch came in Dart to go to strong mode. We were already building out Dart to be very strongly typed for building with the other developers that were used to this from the languages they've built in the past. So when Dart made the decision to go full strong mode, it just hooked us even more as we started going down the pipe and those announcements kept going and it was evolving over. So now that we picked the Dart SDK and we're like, okay, this is what we're gonna use, we still needed a web framework to go on top of it. So we started looking into Angular all the way back at Angular 1.0, and that's the initial prototype and actually the initial portal that we were launching internal that we built off of. So why did we like Angular so much? Well, it, this is just piggybacking off of what Matan was talking about earlier, is that based off the templates and the event bindings, events and bindings, the routing, dependency injection from Everybody in our company that's worked on services on the back end was all within Java and Spring. So they understood dependency injection and the power of it. And then pipes and then Angular Components was announced last year and came out and it's like, great, now we have a core set of libraries we can share. So we've watched Angular evolve from 1.0 to 2, getting broke off to being internal to Dart and getting off the JavaScript builds. And we've seen over time how it's increased Code size has shrunk, speed of download has gotten better and better, and we've seen the improvements that we've built out our portal. So we are very happy at this point, the decision we've made, because it's made us very quick and up to speed on where the browser is going, and also being able to leverage using Dart and Angular Dart to meeting our requirements. So Andrew is a developer that's on my team on the portal infrastructure side, and he came to us from a JavaScript background and a .NET background. And he was able to pick it up and come up to speed very quickly. He discovered that he's not battling things that were in JavaScript before, but Dart just coding it worked the way it was supposed to work out of the box. So this is just proof that he came in, he got up to speed, and he was delivering components that were production ready in about two to three weeks. And, and our teams were starting to use them. So it's a very nice language that you can come up to speed very quickly. And then Keith is on the other side, and he's been at Trustwave for years, all the way back to our legacy portal, and he comes from a Java background. And on the Java side, it was the same type of experience. It didn't matter what type software language background you were coming from, picking up Dart was intuitive and quick to pick up, and you can deliver quickly. So now that we've decided on Dart and Angular Dart, we also, during this UI initiative that we were going off, we, we wanted to rethink our portal design. Our legacy portal was built off of the concept of 
each application was its own module that would load in. But we wanted to break this down to our customer, not by what products they were provisioned to, but more intuitive looking areas within our portal in that top blue area that they are accustomed to across their products. So this is just a small subset at the top of the blue area of like home assets finding support that you can find at the top of our navigation. Below there, depending on what section you pick, you would get a set of menus. This is where a user is provisioned to certain, based off the products they have, what menus they will get. So our portal kind of grows for them as they log in. So they could just maybe have home and assets or assets and findings in the menus that are underneath there. From there, if a user clicks on one of those menus, this is where the team development comes in, that the product team has built one of these elements and it loads within the stage from that point. So this is the vision that we had going forward when we wanted to build out this new UI and the approach that we wanted to take. So how did we use Dart and Angular Dart to achieve this vision that we had? Well, first thing it came down to was building a base component. We needed a contract with our development teams that we knew when this component loaded in, we knew how to interact with it. Also, this base component needed to make sure that it took care of some of the base lifecycle events and we could hook into them for loading things for the user, such as locale information, because we're a global company, or security information, or, secu or properties information. We didn't want to have each one of these development teams doing this on their own. They should just concentrate on the product that they, they build out. And this has always been our vision of how we build a portal infrastructure. So within this class that we built out, this base portal component, you have, it implements base Angular lifecycle events. With true inheritance that comes with, since the Angular 4 came out with components, now teams don't have to worry about implementing these lifecycle events. They can still get hooks in them, but we wanted to be in the, have this in the base component so we can tie into them. So you look on the ng on init override that we have, this is where we load in locale information that's been specified by the implementing component, security information, and properties information. And then based off this component, and I'll show on the next slide, they have hooks into when this information is loaded so they can react to it within their implemented view. Also within here, we have a component service taking advantage of dependency injection. This allows us on this component service, it binds multiple services into it, so then it's dependency injected into our base component for things such as routing and other services we need to call in our base component. So now we have this base component ready to go. The teams can implement and go from there and they can rely on knowing that they have this base functionality they can take advantage of. So how does a team implement this? So now the developers teams basically extend off of the base portal component. This is an example from the asset search component that we have within our portal. So this is a menu of a component that would line up under the area of assets. And within here, we still do the dependency injection of the component service so it can get to the base component so it has a handle on it. But then you look at three overrides that were within this class of the implementation. You have on locale loaded, on security loaded, and on properties loaded. So the one we're gonna look at specifically is the implementation under security loaded. So this function is gonna be called from the base component once the security information is loaded for this component. So this team that's developing this view can rely on at that point, hey, I need to check a permission on a resource and whether they have the execute permission for the search button. The is permitted method comes off the base component as well, so they don't have to be looking through that cache to find that out. So now the team can rely on, hey, let me do that check for that resource, tie it to a Boolean, then I can tie it to my backing HTML template with binding, and that button's gonna be enabled or not. Now we have this base component. We know how to communicate with it. We know how to, it's got a contract within our portal framework. So now our teams can build independently and know when we go to the main deployment and it goes out, that component's gonna work correctly. But they built it out now. How, how do we go about loading it into our portal? And also initially I was talking about, well, we wanna make sure that we keep the initial download time for our portal very quick and we wanna lazy load things in. Well, this is where we take advantage of routing and deferred loading within our portal. So the top URL there you see, this goes into our production environment and you have the bolded assets first that ties to the top menu area. So that means when that route comes in, whether they clicked on it or whether there was a bookmark, it's gonna highlight the blue assets area at the top that has been selected. From there, we need to know, well, what's the menu underneath that area that we wanna go to? 
Well, it's the search area for the asset search. That's where the bolded area on the, on the, the end of the URL is. So no matter how they got to this destination, it routed to this area within the portal. Now the search is tied to a specific element name that's been developed by one of our teams. And that's how we determine at that point, wow, okay, we have this element, we need to put this on the stage. But we wanna make sure when we load that in, that it's just not already in the, in the JavaScript file that's initially downloaded, we wanna make sure we load that in at the point that they, the customer or user wants to access it. So that's the point we wanna defer load it into the element stage. So how do we do that? So this comes with deferred loading. So the first thing you're gonna see at the top is you're gonna import in your file that the asset search component is within. But I'm not importing the asset search file, I'm importing the template file that's not there until it goes through the compile time step. So this isn't here during development time, but it's there at runtime. So we wanna make sure that the first comment at the top of this file, this is just basically telling the IDE and the Dart analyzer, hey, ignore this, I know it's not here at this point, so don't give me a nice red squiggly underneath it, ignore it, it's gonna be there at runtime. But underneath there, you don't just import this as a regular library, we wanna defer load this in. So we wanna make sure that we're telling the compiler that, hey, don't include this in the main JavaScript file, create a part file that can be loaded in during runtime when it needs to be accessed. So that's where the deferred as, and we name it off as asset search view. So now we have it deferred, but now we need to make sure, how do we load this in using Angular and make sure it shows up in the UI when we go through? Well, the next point that we have in here is we have an app view child annotation that's basically saying, I'm looking for a marker in the back HTML to a, a named element called stage and I wanna bring that in as a view cont container reference and I'll call that stage. So now I just have a hook on an element in my backing HTML and this is where I'm gonna load my component next to at this point. Next, I gotta make sure that I have the component loader from Angular dependency injected within to my stage component here. So I make sure that there's dependency injection bringing in the loader so now I have a handle on the loader. So now, just real quick, I should have said this at the beginning. This is really shrunk down just to show the relevant pieces. There's other things that go on, but I just shrunk this down to what we need to show to, to, to have an example of the deferred loading. So the next step is there's this load view component with the element. So when the menu's clicked on, I know what the element name is, and usually there's a bigger you know, case here, switch case, to determine which deferred library I'm gonna load in, but I already know here, so I shrunk this down to loading in the asset search view. So I need to do an async await at this point, and await for loading in that library. After I have a handle on that library, I need to init the reflector, which is gonna tell Angular to make sure that the component's initted so that I can get a handle on the component factory. At the end of this statement, I get a reference on the asset search view, the asset search component with the bolded ng factory at the end. I wanna highlight that because that's another area that's not there during development time but will be there during runtime. So now you have the handle on the component factory. It's been deferred loaded. I have a handle it on it within my backing Dart class, but now I need to call the loader and make sure it's instantiated within the UI. So now I load next to the stage component, this component factory, boom, there you got it. It's loaded in the UI for the customer. So as they've gone through our portal, it wasn't loaded until they went to that area. So that means the customer can be in provision for many, many different views within our portal, but we're not gonna download that into the browser and during the time of have that memory consumption until the user wants to go to that area. So what does this look like after it's gone through the Dart to JS compile step? Well, on the left side, you see without deferred loading. You have one monolithic, huge JavaScript file. That means that every component that's been developed by our teams is in one file, and so at the beginning of the portal loading for a customer to be one download time, there's a little, little spinner that shows and they're waiting. They're like, hey, can this portal load? No, we wanna keep it small. So on the right side, you see it's broken up into many, many, many different part files. Those are different part files from the deferred loading as we import these in. So this means those aren't gonna be loaded into the browser until the user navigates to them. So Tom Smith has been with us since our legacy time and is, he's just stating here he's, how great it's been to leverage the portal components that we developed within our portal, taking advantage of Angular. And it's, it's made it easier for our teams to work independently and come up to speed quickly and know that things are gonna work within our portal framework. So now that the teams have this base component, what about 
the UI components that they need to use. I mean, they have the base component, but they still need to build out the HTML that's gonna render to our users. Well, we have taken advantage of Angular components and built out our own core package that's called UI Angular that houses all of our components. We've extended off of Angular components because it's very easy to take advantage of different utilities they have, and also extending off of just base components to adding more functionality that we needed proprietary to Trustwave. Also, we have our own unique style at Trustwave, and Angular components is built off the wonderful material design, but we have our own unique style at Trustwave. So it's been really easy for us to put our own styles on these components as well. So if you look on the right side, this is just our demo project that we have internal at our company that's just running through all the components that we've t leveraged and taken advantage of. And this is adding our own styles on top of Angular components and some of our own custom build of components as well. But what if, what if in your company there's already a JavaScript library you have because you're converting over from JavaScript to Dart or there's a library out there that you wanna take advantage of um, that's not already been ported over to Dart or Angular Dart. Well, don't worry, you can still take advantage of JavaScript interop. So you can use JavaScript interop, build your own Angular Dart wrapper around it using that facade that you built out, and take advantage of that JavaScript library. So we've done this for two of our components for charting and for our rich text editor. And this is our, our portal live in production on the right side there, an animated GIF that we built. And that's showing our main dashboard, use, taking advantage of high charts through JavaScript interrupt. But also we are looking for at the beginning, we we're saying we want the tools IDE integration. Well, you get now with the Dart plugin with an IntelliJ, and we take advantage of IntelliJ because we're also a Java company as well for our backend services. So now our developers can work within one IE within IntelliJ on both Dart and on our Java side. We get the code analysis, the code completion, the refactoring. I wasn't able to build a real complicated GIF on this side because recording myself coding just didn't work very well. But this is the Dart reformatting that takes place, the Dart formatter. And I, I have to say, I love the Dart formatter. Coming from the Java side and all the battles and arguments over formatting and going back and forth, it's really nice that Dart comes out with just one formatter and you can tell the teams, there's formatting already within, stick with it, we're not gonna come up with our own. Now, the teams have built out all of these different packages, and we talked about earlier, it's like, well, we need some sort of dependency management to bring this all together. Well, this really sold us using Dart as well. We have our own internal pub server that we publish all the core packages up to that the teams can take advantage of, and they also publish their views up so we can bring it into the main build that we're gonna talk about later on. So we've fallen in love with the semantic version that takes place that Kevin was talking about earlier. We use the current syntax on it and we avoid a lot of breaking changes and conflicts that come in. So on this slide here, it's, the, it's just an example of PubSpec YAML that shows the URLs of our internal pub server that we're taking advantage of to bring in some of our core packages to one of our component libraries that we build up. Now we need to bring it all together, okay? The teams have worked on their views and we need to bring it into one main build. So on the right side is our main PubSpec YAML that's in our main build. I think it's about 35 plus packages that we pull in from our main internal pub server into one build. So our teams can work independently. They can publish off their packages and know when we build this off, we pulled in with the semantic versioning and make sure we pull in the, the proper version from our teams. This avoids breaking changes so, because we make sure we handle the versioning correctly. And if there is a breaking change that comes from our, one of our core components, we make sure we notify our teams at that point. But we also need to make sure we have automated builds. We had this in the past and we wanted to make sure we could do this with Dart as well. So we use Jenkins as our continuous integration build server. And we have built off a process within there that runs two to three times a day on the main portal framework build so our teams can make sure they deploy their packages and it'll be brought in and, and go off to our test networks. So on the right shows our main build and this is going through at first a pub upgrade to bring in the, the new packages, does a pub build. After that point, it goes ahead and tars up the entire build, sends it off to our internal Nexus server and then our DevOps teams pick it off from there and, and deploy it off into our test networks. So really, our, we're hands off at this point. So our teams can work independent of the portal framework and they can rely on knowing that this is gonna go out into the test networks. On top of that, 
we, have, we added some traceability into this automated build. In the back in HTML, we put in when the deploy date was, what the version went out, so that our teams, our development teams can say, hey, did I make it into that deploy? We also put out in only our test network deploys the pub spec lock file. So they can look at that out there and say, oh man, I didn't make it. I missed it this window, but I know it's gonna be in the next window, my newest version. So at Trustwave, we are extremely happy with our implementation of Angular Dart and Dart. We've been internal at the company for uh, about a year and a half internally using our portal. We went beta at the end of last year, and I'm happy to announce this quarter one, we have gone GA in front of our customers. It's worked wonderful for us. <laughs> and we're looking forward to coming up soon with Dart 2 and also Angular 5, the Dart Dev compiler we wanna start using to get out of using Dartium and going straight into Chrome and with the Dart Dev compiler. And this quarter, we're starting to develop our mobile solution within Flutter. So we're gonna take advantage of our middle layer, our business layer, we have a core packages to take advantage of those core services on the back end and just focus on the UI for our mobile solution. Thank you.